Ja, wil jy nie net gaan vir my kom kyk hier so op die skerm hoe dit like as ek nie staan nie? Asblief. Sê my net my op die skerm kyk hoe lyk dit al. Ek kan net op die skerm kyk hoe lyk dit al. Ek kan net op die skerm kyk hoe lyk dit al. Ek kan net op die skerm kyk hoe lyk dit al. Ok, maar dan verander omgegaf my hier dat hy... Ok, dit... Sien jy my dit? Ja, lekker. Ok, en nou praat ek... So, gaan ons die blomme dag hier so sit. Ja, die skeer. So? Die skeer. Sit om hier so? Ja. Asblief? As hy... Moet lekker ek nie? Nog een bykie op. Klik op die blomme rekens. Ja, die blomme is fijn. So, daar is hy. Ok. Ok. En jy is seker, sy gaan nie so staan. Jy het dit met al gecheck. Sy gaan nie soos Annika maak, want ek het nie nou die tripod op. Het is die nacht wat hier kat in die meer gaan. Ek het het afgehoog en daar wit, hy tel die wit op. Wil jylle nie graag van te laap, ek krij nie die kom skoon maak. Of jy het afgeen en die sand het ondergaan. Ek hoop dat het skeep. Ek hoop dat hy... Sien my man. Maar daar is niks aan die skeep wat ons kan doen nie, want ek bedoel, hy is... Ja, ons vang het jy. Oké. Ja, ons vang het ook uit geoog. Ek heb die sand gelijk op, voor die kamer. Ja. Ok, sy sien nie die blomme nie Maar dis fijn Daarom is sy nie Ok, ok Ek kan klaar voor uit, kom ons kyk Nee, ek kan klaar voor uit, is toch kok, Jolandi? Ek kan klaar voor uit, is toch kok, Jolandi? Ja, maar as jy klomp mense gaan in die sand gaan, dan wil ek het nie Kijk, 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 Is it alright? Hmm? You're on the internet, right? What's it? You're on the internet. I guess live, yeah? She's always a vision for me. You mean it's all? What's it now? Yeah. No, Alma. Ek is bezig hier nie. Ek is bezig.
Mas se você ia mudar isso para mim. Mas se você. Mas se você. Mas eu sei. Tira meu filho, eu sei que eu vou. Nem o homem. Eu tenho que fazer uma coisa. Não posso. Já. Dan ik weer. Kitty.
my great pleasure to welcome all of you here present tonight and in particular I would like to welcome Professor Eugene Kluter, our DBC Innovation Research and Postgraduate Studies at the Stellenbosch University, colleagues from other faculties, friends, colleagues, students and of course our very special guest tonight Professor Shorpi williams Elegbe. A family, including her husband Dio, her two daughters, her mother and her sister who traveled to be here tonight, you are all very welcome. It is now my pleasure to briefly introduce Professor Williams Allegri to yourselves. Born in Geneva, Switzerland, Shopi Williams Allegri is one of four children. She studied law at the University of Lagos, the London School of Economics and Political Science, and 
the University of Nottingham. She completed her PhD under the supervision of the renowned Professor Sue Arrowsmith of Nottingham University. It may perhaps also be of interest for you to know that Shope is not the only law professional uh, in this family. Shope's mother, Kemi, is a barrister, and her brother, Ben Williams, is an associate at a law firm in Chicago. So uh, you shouldn't pick a battle with this family. <laughs> Shope taught, and she also served as the head of research at various universities in Nigeria and the United Kingdom, before she became a research fellow at this faculty of law in the Department of Public Law around 2012. Um, and then in July 2016, she was appointed as associate professor in the Department of Mercantile. And then she was promoted to full professor in 2017. I want to pause here again to reflect that Shope is also not the only academic in the Williams family. She also has a sister who specializes in ecology. Um, so also a very academic family. Professor William Delegbe has published widely, including two books, with another one with a South African focus on his work. And she has also presented at numerous conferences. She's written many, many book chapters uh, and articles. She's co-edited works. And next week, there will be a great book launch here at the African Procurement Conference titled Public Procurement Regulation for 21st Century Africa, co-edited with her colleague, Hio Kino. Shope has received awards, various instances of funding for her research, and she has consulted for various governments and organizations. She was, for example, the only academic on the World Bank's first international technical advisory group. This group advised the World Bank regarding technical aspects on procurement, in particular the integrity of public procurement. She is currently also involved in training officials from the Office of the Public Protector of South Africa, and of course she lectures in various modules in this faculty. In short, Shope is an academic through and through which gives rise to this occasion tonight, an inaugural lecture. As I've said in the past, an inaugural lecture gives this faculty, as well as Stavenbosch University, the platform to recognize the progression and the advancements of a academic, a colleague. Uh, if you like, you could see tonight as the ceremonial taking up of a official position as professor in the discipline of law. An inaugural lecture is, of course, also an occasion for an individual to share a very rare opportunity to share both her professional and her personal life and to showcase all that she's been working on for so many years with her family and friends around her. Lastly, an inaugural lecture is also an opportunity to increase awareness about topical research issues. And tonight's topic certainly deals with a very contemporary issue, namely public procurement, corruption, and blockchain technology, a preliminary legal inquiry. I now invite Professor Williams and Lekpe to deliver the inaugural lecture. Good afternoon or evening, everyone. Thank you for coming out. Um, I was a little bit scared that no one will turn up because it's such an esoteric topic. So I'm really glad that you guys are here. <laughs> um, so the topic today is public procurement, corruption and blockchain technology, a preliminary legal inquiry. So my journey as an academic started about 18 years, almost exactly 18 years ago today when I joined University of Stirling in Scotland as a lecturer on the 30th of October, year 2000. So it's been exactly 18 years since my first appointment. I also should have had a child that time, but <laughs> so at least my children will be older. Um, 
But my academic interest in public procurement started a little later in year 2003 when I joined the University of Nottingham. Um, and Nottingham had a practice of assigning senior colleagues to junior colleagues. So I was assigned Professor Sue Arrowsmith as my senior mentor. Sue Arrowsmith is the world's leading expert in public procurement. And within a year, she was able to convince me to adopt public procurement as my primary research area. And it's a decision that I haven't regretted. And I'm grateful to Sue for her guidance and her mentorship while I was at Nottingham and also for supervising my PhD. Um, as a scholar interested in public procurement, I was unable to escape the increasing manifestations of corruption in public procurement, especially in Africa. Um, it's very rare that you have a conversation about public procurement that does not involve the issue of corruption. And so in 2006, I decided to undertake doctoral studies in order to examine whether excluding corrupt contractors from public procurement was a good way of dealing with procurement corruption. Um, in the past five years, my interest in public procurement has gone through some highs and lows as I've become really frustrated with the futility of traditional legal responses to procurement corruption. So despite the existence of a very robust legal framework, it seems that you can't divorce corruption from public procurement, especially in, in Africa. In South Africa, the procurement framework has become synonymous with illegality and state capture. And so my research has turned to innovative ways by which we can address procurement corruption um, in systemically corrupt societies. More recently, as the media hype about blockchain became um, increasingly um, became voluble, driven by fluctuations in the value of Bitcoin, I began to consider whether blockchain technology could be a solution to the problem of corruption in public procurement. So this lecture is a reflection on whether blockchain could be useful to address corruption in public procurement and how it might be, um, you know, how it might be used. Now, I give this lecture with the caveat that I'm not a technical person at all. So I'm going to try to present the information in, a, in the least technical way possible. Um, so please don't ask me any questions about how to develop a blockchain platform. I don't know. <laughs> I'll just tell you now. So because this is a, a relatively new area, um, my lecture is futuristic in its approach. Um, even though blockchain technology has been around for a while, it has only recently become accessible. Um, and the embryonic nature of the technology means that its functionalities are also neoteric. So I'm going to talk about what blockchain is, um, talk about corruption in procurement, and then talk about how we can use blockchain technology in the procurement space and the issues that this might pre present. Um, we say that there's always there's a solution to every problem, but also every solution brings its own problems, and we'll look at some of those. So blockchain technology um, is a software, basically. It's, it's a piece of software. The um, creation of blockchain technology is credited to a person that goes by the name Natoshi Sakamoto or Satoshi Nakamoto. It's believed that this is a pseudonym and nobody knows the true identity of this person. So the person that goes by the name Nakamoto developed this technology in 2009, but as far back as 1991, there had already been academic work on how to secure information in a manner in blocks, in the manner in which the blockchain works. But Nakamoto is credited as the creator of blockchain because he actually built the technology. He built the platform. So we define blockchain as a database, a way of storing records of value and transactions. Even though this is a good definition, it's an accurate definition, but it doesn't tell us why blockchain is revolutionary or even interesting. What makes blockchain fascinating is the fact that it is both a digitized and a decentralized ledger of transactions. So as I've said, it's a software, it's a piece of software, but it's a software that records information, um, data, transactions in a way that other software um, cannot. So the blockchain is an open distributed ledger that can record transactions between two people efficiently and in a verifiable and permanent way. So what a distributed ledger does is that it allows any number of computers to keep an identical record of information without having to reference a master copy. In other words, every copy of the record that is kept on the computers on the network is identical. It means that the record of information or transactions cannot be altered by any of the participating parties unless it is altered by all of them. So I'm sure you can already imagine the benefits of such a platform. It's, it basically functions the same way as when you work on Google Docs with someone. 
So everybody that's working on the document has the same copy, the same master copy, um, and there's no difference. So if there's a change to the documents, everyone sees it. So that's basically the way the blockchain works. So the data or the transactions in a blockchain are stored in a block, and each new block is linked to the previous block in a logical sequence and recorded in chronological order without the need for a centralized record keeping system. A single transaction or record cannot be deleted or amended unless the entire chain of blocks or information sequential to um, the previous block are also rewritten. Every transaction that is submitted to the block is only added after it has been verified as legitimate by all the participants. So before there's any transaction is, is accepted on the blockchain, all the per participants on that blockchain would have to verify that that transaction is legitimate. So it almost eliminates the possibility of fraudulent transactions. And all blockchains work in that way. Identical copies of the database are shared amongst the communi community of participating com computers, which we call nodes. And if a person wants to execute a transaction on that platform, a request is sent to the network where it is received for processing by the nodes. And the nodes, either through a consensus algorithm or an administrator, determine whether that request is authentic. And if it is authentic, the ledger is then automatically updated with a new block of data. Where a blockchain platform is public, it means that anyone can query the information that is put um, on the blockchain. Um, two professors in Harvard Business School, Ion City and Lakani, explained that in blockchain-based pl um, platforms, transactions and contracts can be embedded in digital code and stored in transparent shared databases where they are protected from deletion, tampering, and revision. In this world, every agreement, every process, every task, and every payment would have a digital record and signature that could be identified, validated, stored, and shared. Intermediaries like lawyers, brokers, and bankers might no longer be necessary. As a lawyer, I really hope it doesn't come to that because I, I would like to keep, keep on working. <laughs> um, but the truth is that blockchain technology is able to democratize contracting in a way that it will obviate, obviate the need for certain types of intermediaries such as estate agents, and in some cases, yes, lawyers. So for instance, if we consider a situation where land titles are stored on a blockchain, um, this means that all ownership and encumbrances on a title are transparent, cannot be tampered with, and don't need to be searched or verified by an intermediary. Property transactions become safer, quicker, and are no longer prone to fraud. In some developing countries, Conflicting land titles and ownership present a real challenge to property transfers. And a blockchain system completely eliminates this risk. Blockchain is currently being used to register land titles in a number of countries, Honduras, India, Sweden, in Africa, um, Rwanda, and Ghana. Um, and Dubai is undergoing a project where by 2020, all government transactions would be concluded on a blockchain platform. So blockchain is, is really here to stay. Um, now, the blockchain technology was developed to support Bitcoin, and I'm sure everyone here has heard of Bitcoin. Everybody has heard of Bitcoin. Okay. Um, so, the blockchain was developed to support Bitcoin, which is its most popular um, and notorious application, but it's not really necessarily its most useful or even viable application. Bitcoin is a virtual or a digital currency, which we refer to as a cryptocurrency because of the inherent cryptographic security. Um, as a currency, Bitcoin can be transferred and spent without the need for an intermediary such as a bank or a payment gateway such as PayPal. So it basically enables you to transfer money to someone else without going through a bank or going through any form of intermediary. So it's direct peer-to-peer -peer, um, transacting. So Bitcoin enables bilateral financial transactions on a platform that is open, distributed, and trustless. And we say trustless because if you're transacting without using an intermediary such a bank, of course, the issue of fraud arises. How do I trust the person that I'm, um, I'm dealing with? But the, the blockchain allows us to transact without the presence of a trusted third party such as a bank. And people don't have to provide for the risk of not trusting their contracting party because the the blockchain only allows a transaction after it has been verified by other users. So the blockchain allows peer-to-peer -peer transacting, which eliminates the need 
for a central authority to issue currency, transfer ownership, or confirm transactions. Um, and that's some of the aspects of the Bitcoin or the blockchain that make it um, really fascinating as a technology. According to Kevia, who is a US-based lawyer, the blockchain is revolutionary for various reasons. In his words, because it is an authentication and verification technology, it can enable more efficient title transfers and ownership verification. Because it is programmable, it can enable conditional smart contracts. Because it is decentralized, it can perform these functions with minimal trust without using centralized institutions. Because it is borderless and frictionless, it can provide a cheaper, faster infrastructure for exchanging units of value. So what does all this mean? If we look at authentication and verification, where two people transact on a blockchain network, for instance, if we're transferring Bitcoin, the transferor sends a message to the network about the transaction. The receiver also sends a network to also sends a message to the network accepting the transaction and asking the network to authenticate and verify and verify it. This verification is by majority decision, and we call it the proof of work. And what it is really is a competition among the network participants to verify the particular transaction. And users within the system are incentivized to, to bear the computational costs of validation because successful participants are rewarded with new Bitcoin. And that's how the Bitcoin ecosystem funds itself. So validation reduces the need to rely on third party intermediaries. And once the transaction is verified, the transaction block is updated to reflect it. If we talk about being programmable, um, transactions conducted on a blockchain can be programmed, meaning that an algorithm can be created. Meaning that an algorithm can be created that would automatically trigger a transaction at a certain point or automate processes to be added to the blockchain. This is one of the most exciting aspects of blockchain. It allows for the execution of what we call smart contracts, where an algorithm creates a conditional contract. And when the contract conditions are met, it triggers other processes such as payments. So the blockchain can be used to register, confirm, and transfer all manner of property without the need for intermediaries. Each participant on a blockchain platform has access to the, S the entire database and its complete history. And this is what we mean when we say that the blockchain is decentralized. So no person controls the information or the record of the transactions, and any person can verify the transactions as I've already described. Whilst traditional centralized data storage may be more resource efficient, it's also more vulnerable as hackers only need to access the main server in order to wreak havoc. For instance, if we think about the Equifax breach in 2017, where the data of about 143 million people was hacked by servers, um, the, that would not happen on a blockchain-based platform because there isn't a main server where the data is stored. So the decentralized data storage of a blockchain platform means that the data is distributed across all the computers on the network, making hacking extremely difficult, if not impossible. The blockchain is also described as being borderless and frictionless. So traditional transactions usually require the presence of intermediaries, and these intermediaries provide the trust that is required for us to proceed in transactions. The presence of these intermediaries, however, increases transaction costs and can cause delays. But as I've already said, the blockchain facilitates direct peer-to-peer -peer transacting, which reduces transaction costs and the friction costs by having to rely on intermediaries. The blockchain establishes trust between the parties to the transaction, both through the, through the decentralized public ledger and a cryptographic mechanism that prevents transactions from being altered after the fact. So I'll talk a little bit about public procurement and corruption. So for those of you who are not in the procurement space, when we talk about public procurement, we're really just talking about the process by which the government um, buys the goods, services, and works that it needs to function and maximize public welfare. So anytime the government buys anything, that is, is what we call public procurement. Um, so procurement is an integral aspect of the public financial management system, and it cannot be divorced from public, um, from budgeting, um, accounting, and governance system. But procurement is very important because it, it is the main conduit for government expenditure. It's the main way by which the government spends funds, apart from through grants and social programs. 
Um, in South Africa, the annual procurement spend is estimated to be, up, to be about 800 billion rand. And the, in the state's um, capture commission of inquiry, the chief procurement officer estimated that about 50% of this money is lost to corruption. So that's a hell of a lot of money. <laughs> um, so of course, there's um, an extensive literature on corruption in public procurements. We have literature that describes the extent of, of corruption, the type of corruption, and the measures that we can use to address this corruption. Um, in their work, Campus and Pradhan, who are two academics, provided in indicators of red flags in a procurement process. And their work illustrated that almost every point in a procurement process is at risk of corruption. Whilst there are measures that we can put in place to limit these risks, many of them cannot be eliminated. In countries that have a problem with systemic corruption, it's even harder to address procurement corruption because when you have systemic corruption, it means the anti-corruption enforcement um, system is also corrupted and prone to manipulation by the corrupt. So if you think of countries where there are issues with the police and the prosecutors and the judiciary, then you know how do you really fight corruption when the anti-corruption enforcement is also corrupted? Um, corruption in procurement is enabled by the reliance on intermediaries in the, public, in the procurement process. Of course, if the government is buying anything, it has to go through public officials, procurement officials, and we call this problem the agency problem. And this is basically when the interests of those officials conflict with the interest of the state or the interest of the citizens. So from deciding what we're going to buy to the specifications um, of what we're going to do and in the evaluation of tenders, contract award decisions can be manipulated in many ways. These can include a, a lack of transparency, adopting a contracting process that is in effect a fait accompli, and the failure to publicize decisions. Contract implementation, monitoring, and payments um, also pre present several opportunities for corruption. A common way of addressing the agency problem is to limit the discretion of public officials in decision-making, provide multiple approval levels, and develop an enforcement framework to sanitize the procurement process. And these are actually similar to the solutions that blockchain provides in relation to Bitcoin. Maintaining trust and preventing fraud in payments without relying on third-party intermediaries to limit the risk of dishonesty on the part of contracting partners. In public procurement, we use various mechanisms to prevent, public, to prevent corrupt contractors from participating in a tenders process. These include requiring contractors to provide documentary evidence to verify their identity, requiring registration with the Chamber of Commerce or on a government database, and requiring the exclusion of contractors who have previously proven to be unethical, and also requiring affidavits of compliance with various legislations, um, various regulations, such as those pertaining to modern slavery and money laundering. In relation to public officials, we require them to declare and avoid conflicts of interest. This is an area that South Africa um, currently struggles with, um, you know, awarding contracts to, you know, interested persons. We require them to record procurement proceedings, publish relevant information, and meet certain standards of professionalism and ethics. However, all these safeguards have not resulted in significant reductions in the levels of corruption in procurement. Um, if you read any of the recent reports by the Auditor General, you'll see that um, there's been immense increases in fraudulent expenditure linked to procurement spending in South Africa. You only need to watch um, a few sessions of the Commission of Inquiry on State Capture to know that there's a very, very big problem. Um, and many of the measures and the laws that we put in place to address procurement corruption um, have not actually served to do that. So I'll talk now about contracting using blockchain, talk about smart contracts and how they might be useful in the procurement contracts. So when we talk about contracting using the blockchain, we're talking about what we call smart contracts. Smart contracts are just blockchain transactions that go beyond cryptocurrency or payments and have more extensive instructions embedded in them. A smart contract is basically a contract that is formed and performed using a blockchain platform. For smart contracts, contractual terms are converted into a computer code, and this code is uploaded into a blockchain, and the system acts in accordance with the code to execute the contract. Werbeck and Cornell 
define a smart contract as an agreement in digital form that is self-executing and self-enforcing, while Rayskin describes it as an agreement wherein execution is automated. Automation ensures performance for better or worse by excising human discretion from contract execution. In traditional contracts, the parties agree to do or refrain from doing something on particular terms. Depending on the jurisdiction, something of value may be required in exchange for this promise. The parties to the contract have to trust that the other contracting party will act in accordance with the terms of the contract, and provisions are included in the contract to mitigate the risk of breach and provide penalties when this occurs. Smart contracts operate in the same way, in the sense that there is an agreement between two parties, but they remove the need for one type of trust between the parties. This is because a smart contract is both defined by the code and executed by the code automatically and without discretion. We can liken smart contracts to the contracts to the transactions that we conduct with vending machines. In such contracts, once a condition is fulfilled, the selection of the required item and insertion of payments, the machine has no discretion as to whether or not to perform. And as long as there is no mechanical fault, the machine will perform according to its program. Of course, there's no need for you to trust in the vending machine as there is no option for it to perform or not to perform the contract. Unlike a person, a vending machine behaves algorithmically. The same instruction set will be followed every time in every case and will yield the same outcome. When you deposit money into the machine and you make a selection, the item is released. There is no possibility of the machine not complying or only partially complying. Similarly, a smart contract cannot help but execute the code or the algorithm and does not require the presence of an intermediary to ensure that the contractual terms are complied with. I often wish that my children will behave algorithmically. <laughs> <laughs> that if we brushed our teeth last night, we're going to do it again tonight without complaining or crying. But it doesn't work like that. So the use of smart contracts presents many features that are not inherent in traditional contracts. These are trust, irreversibility, autonomy, and decentralization. In relation to trust, because the contract is digitally verified and authenticated by the blockchain, there's no need for you to know or trust the other contracting party. Documents are digitally signed and funds can be placed in escrow on the blockchain and released according to the terms of the contract. Irreversibility means two things. First, that the smart contract is executed in terms of the code and cannot be stopped. And second, that the record of the transaction on a blockchain cannot be altered. In other words, the records are immutable. The irreversibility of the contract presents one of the greatest challenges to the adoption of smart contracts, as these contracts cannot be renegotiated, rescinded, or breached, as is possible with traditional contracts. Autonomy means that after the smart contract is launched, it becomes independent and no longer requires further contact between the contracting parties. In terms of decentralization, I've already discussed that the blockchain is a decentralized record of information, data, and transactions. Smart contracts are also decentralized in that the record of transaction is not kept in a centralized server, but is distributed amongst all the participants in that system. These, small, these four attributes of smart contracts can potentially alter the nature of contracts formation and execution. Formation no longer requires the extensive use of lawyers as contract terms are particular to the transaction and are programmed as a computer code. The contract does not have to be policed for enforcement for, does not have to be policed for performance as it is self-executing. Irrever irreversibility potentially means that the contract cannot be rescinded or breached by the default of the parties and contract completion is assured. However, smart contracts create other problems for contract law. All jurisdictions contain certain requirements for the validity of a contract, such as contractual capacity, legality, certainty, consideration, and the absence of vitiating circumstances, such as mistake, duress, undue influence, and unconscionability. The presence or absence of prohibited or required factors may make a contract void or voidable. Smart contracts, however, do not provide for moderation on these issues as the code self-executes, even if vitiating factors are present. So I've said that smart contracts are like the contracts we perform with a vending machine. Of course, if a vending machine is selling alcohol, it doesn't know if the person buying is over the age of 18 or not. And that's the way smart contracts are. 
they will execute according to the code, irrespective of circumstances that might be prevailing. In the words of Rayskin, a smart contract asks its parties to tie themselves to the mast, like Ulysses, and ex ante commit to abiding by the terms of the agreement. Unlike traditional contracts, the performance of which can be stopped by the parties or by a court, a smart contract must, by definition, execute once initiated, which means that a court confronted with a smart contract may be helpless to stop it. Smart contracts thus pre present difficult issues that all legal systems will need to grapple with. How can a legal system that relies on documents and testimony to understand transactions comprehend and interpret a contract that is written in code? More importantly, how can a court undo a transaction that is self-executing and is irreversibly encoded on a distributed blockchain where there is no technical means short of undermining the integrity of the entire system to unwind a transfer. The answer may lie within smart contracts themselves, as it is possible to incorporate logic within the smart contract that allows for various exceptions or conditions. Another issue is determining how to reify remedies for smart contracts. Contract law remedies might need to be adapted where rescission is no longer possible and specific performance is unnecessary. So how can we use smart contracts in public procurements? We've said that smart contracts permit parties to directly transfer digital assets or value without any institution acting as an exchange intermediary. In public procurement, there are several intermediaries that present a problem for probity in the procurement process. First, we have procurement officials who act as an intermediary for the government. Um, who in turn is supposed to be acting as an intermediary for the people, although you wouldn't know this from the way they behaved. In addition, we have institutions that provide assurance on the integrity of contractors, such as chambers of commerce. In relation to procurement corruption, issues arise primarily because of the agency problem and the asymmetry of information, as smart contracts can alleviate both these issues. The challenge then is to decipher how procurement may be executed and regulated using a blockchain. The public procurement system may take its inspiration from the private sector, which is increasingly relying on blockchain technology for supply chain management. So, for example, in 2016, Walmart, Nestle, Unilever, um, and a few other large companies established a food trust blockchain system to track food in their supply chains. This is expected to improve their ability to identify issues involved in food recalls such as tracing outbreaks more quickly to limit customer risk. In 2017, the world's largest pharmaceutical companies also announced the blockchain-based MediLedger project in order to track medicines and prevent counterfeit medicines from entering the supply chain to payments to patients. The increasing adoption of blockchain and smart contracts has been said to embody a trend towards greater machine autonomy. Insofar as computers can increasingly take the place of humans in negotiating, forming, performing, and enforcing contracts, contracts can increasingly operate with the speed and consistency of machines. And this is something that is both exciting and frightening at the same time. According to Deloitte, there are four pain points for private sector supply chains, which are traceability, compliance, flexibility, and stakeholder management. And these pain points are similar to those experienced by public procurement systems in a multi-layered context. The private sector is increasingly discovering that these issues can be addressed by a blockchain platform. So traceability <coughs> refers to the ability to monitor events and metadata associated with a product. In the public procurement context, it refers to the ability to monitor contractors' performance across the entire public procurement system. This capability is currently not available in the public procurement systems of developing countries where government departments operate in silos, an, efficiency that have, an issue that affects the efficiency of public purchasing. Secondly, compliance refers to the imposition of standards and controls to provide evidence that regulatory conditions are being met. In the public procurement context, ensuring bidder and contractor compliance with various laws, such as those pertaining to corruption, tax, environmental protection, and black economic empowerment, is a major reason for the convoluted regulation that the procurement process is subject to. Blockchain may provide a less burdensome means for ensuring compliance in a manner that eliminates the risk of fraud. Third, flexibility refers to the ability to adapt rapidly to events or issues without significantly 
increasing operational costs. In public procurements, flexibility is often sacrificed on the altar of compliance with the rules, and it's often difficult for public agencies to adapt to new situations without terminating a procurement process. Whilst the discretion of public officials has been constrained to minimize the opportunities for corruption, blockchain provides the opportunity for real-time tracking of data and information, which can be used for contingency planning. Finally, stakeholder management speaks to the provision of effective governance to enable communication, risk reduction, and trust amongst the parties involved. In public procurement, the stakeholders include the parties involved in the procurement <clears throat> process, citizens, civil society, and accountability mechanisms such as the Auditor General. Managing these stakeholders and providing accurate, timely, and relevant information is a problem that affects procurement systems across the world. Blockchain can improve stakeholder management as the transactions concluded on it are decentralized. An open blockchain will also afford the public access to extremely granular information on a procurement process. Mexico is actually currently testing a blockchain application for tracking public tenders and for tracking government contractors as well. A typical public procurement process in South Africa as elsewhere comprises of several phases. These are the pre-procurement phase, the procurement and project delivery phase, and the completion phase. The phase that is subject to the most regulation is the procurement and project delivery phase. Um, and this phase usually commences with an advertisement in an appropriate medium to notify prospective bidders about the contract opportunity and advise them of tender requirements. This process can easily be incorporated into a blockchain platform where a procuring authority or government agency can create a request to purchase from the private sector, specifying the criteria such as price, delivery date, and functionality. Participating bidders on that platform are notified of that request and could then submit their bids and the procuring entity could then choose how it will select a supplier. An important aspect of the procurement process is verifying the suitability of potential suppliers. In public procurement, this is undertaken by an extensive qualification process, which verifies bidders' compliance with legal regulations and determines their responsibility and their ability to perform the contract. Relevant factors include past contractual performance, prior convictions, financial records, and technical qualifications. A procurement blockchain platform can improve the process for identifying and verifying potential bidders, simplify contractor registration, provide a shared information repository on contractors' past performance, and enable real-time reporting. A government-wide blockchain platform could thus be used to onboard contractors and manage contractor relationships with all public sector agencies. This would reduce the risk of doing business with new contractors, open the door to increase competition and participation in public tenders while reducing the barriers to entry for smaller suppliers who do not currently participate in public tenders due to the high costs involved. A blockchain-based procurement contract is attractive for several reasons. The auditability and verifiability of transactions is unparalleled when compared with paper and e-procurement systems which are prone to fraud and manipulation. And the transparency inherent in the blockchain meets the higher standards for public sector accountability. So I mentioned at the beginning that um, there are always challenges that attend any solution that is proposed. Um, and blockchain, even though it's a fascinating piece of technology, it also brings its own challenges. And so we'll look at some of those legal problems. So like most procurement lawyers, I'm often concerned with whether the procurement regulatory framework is fit for purpose. Despite the shortcomings of extant procurement regulations, they serve to insist consistent, they serve to, they serve to ensure consistency in public procurement and can fulfill policy objectives if they're properly implemented. In his thesis, Ude identified the goals of procurement regulation as including competition, integrity, value for money, wealth distribution, risk avoidance and uniformity. But procurement regulation also provides the means for enforcing procurement rules and remedying breaches where they occur. We thus have to consider whether smart procurement contracts can be regulated in the same manner as traditional procurement and how we can resolve smart procurement disputes. Procurement in South Africa is regulated by several pieces of legislation as well as by institutional oversight. 
The laws provide direction on the procurement process, prohibited practices, and, ac and accountability and governance. In terms of institutional oversight, the National Treasury houses the office of the Chief Procurement Officer, which is broadly responsible for overseeing public procurement in South Africa. A public procurement blockchain platform has the potential to transform the fragmented nature of procurement oversight by providing the Chief Procurement Officer with access to real-time information and metadata on public procurement contracts across the country. A procurement blockchain platform can provide the Chief Procurement Officer with information on, for instance, transversal contracts and enable the Chief Procurement Officer to monitor those contracts whilst maintaining, whilst managing relationships with stakeholders and contractors. A procurement blockchain platform will help us understand areas of conflict within the regulatory framework, enhance the efficiency of the Chief Procurement Officer's oversight and reduce friction and disputes within the system. Conducting public procurement by a blockchain platform ought not to change the nature of procurement regulation but may serve to make it more efficient, transparent, and less likely to result in disputes. This is partly because the terms of a contract and the state of facts relating to performance of the contract cannot be amended or overridden by any individual, mistakenly or, ma or maliciously. The blockchain ensures that there's always a single version of the truth. An important function of procurement regulation is also to provide for remedies in the event of a breach of procurement rules. Disputes may be brought by different classes of persons affected by the procurement process. Now, there's a misconception that because they execute automatically, smart contracts remove the potential for disputes. In reality, whilst they reduce the scope for disputes, partly because of the reduced ambiguity in programming language, the intersection of contract law and code creates new areas of potential disputes. One issue that arises is how smart contracts may be terminated or modified for reasons such as performance on the basis of inaccurate data, discrepancies between the computer code and the natural language of the contract, or rescinded for a vitiating circumstance. With a smart contract, the aggrieved party will essentially be seeking a remedy for a contract that has already been executed by the time the court hears the case. Any remedy must come after the fact to undo or alter the agreement in some way, as injunctions cannot operate to delay or stop performance once a dispute arises. There have been a few suggestions as to how smart contracts disputes may be resolved. This will either take the form of resolution in a traditional forum, whether by the court or arbitration, or online dispute resolution, which may be on the blockchain itself. Parties could incorporate a reference to arbitration into the smart contract, including information about the seat of arbitration and the governing law. In relation to online dispute resolution, the parties may agree to refer disputes to a central blockchain administrator with the power to determine disputes and insert remedial transactions into the blockchain as necessary. A variation on this is where the parties incorporate, it, incorporate into the smart contract an agreement to refer disputes to arbitration and a mechanism to allow the arbitrator to automatically enforce any award without the intervention of a third party. For instance, the multi-signature mechanism enables the parties to collectively nominate an arbitrator, which then triggers the power of that arbitrator to transfer assets or money on the blockchain. Another approach that marries blockchain technology with traditional resolution is where disputes are referred to arbitrators and their decision is then recorded on the blockchain. However, in the context of public procurement in South Africa, the courts in all paid companies South Africa Limited made it clear that procurement disputes cannot be the subject of private arbitration. In that case, it was held that the Promotion of Administrative Justice Act precludes any forum apart from the High Court and the Constitutional Court to adjudicate over claims brought in terms of the Administrative Justice Act. The parties cannot confer jurisdiction upon a private arbitrator to decide a claim brought in terms of the Administrative Justice Act, because to allow such would be to allow parties to privatize constitutional disputes and this bears the risk of allowing a parallel constitutional jurisprudence to develop in this country, one that is separate and independent from that developed by the constitutional court. So that signals that private sector dispute resolution models cannot be utilized to address the administrative law aspects of smart procurement disputes, and that such contracts will need to contain embedded instructions for reference to the courts. Of course, this will severely test the court's adaptability 
adaptability, but I have faith in the Constitutional Court as it has already shown its creativity in addressing public procurement disputes. So this paper has presented the transparency and auditability of blockchain technology as a solution to the problem of corruption in public procurement. As the technology is still being piloted in various spheres, we might be some years away from its adoption, but I'm convinced that in the long term, as it gains traction and continues to prove its functionality, we will begin to see blockchain platforms increasingly being used by the private, by the public sector. Like many new ideas, the adoption of blockchain will have to overcome obstacles, which would include an aversion to new technologies, integration with legacy systems, the cost of adoption, and gaining stakeholder support. I think that what will be crucial is whether we, as legal academics, will be able to understand and teach the legal implications of blockchain technology for the private law of contract, for taxation, and for the public procurement system. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. So it's customary to use this platform to appreciate people who have made a role or who have played a role in one's journey. Um, and I'd like to use the next couple of minutes to thank several people. So please bear with me, don't leave yet. <laughs> um, so first, of course, I would like to thank God for loving me in such an exceptional way. I'm convinced that I'm his favorite human being of all time. <laughs> so that is my claim and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> If you don't like it, argue with your pastor. <laughs> um, of course, many people think their parents are wonderful, but mine are, are more than that. My parents were so intentional in the way that they raised us, um, even though it wasn't always pleasant for them or for us. For those of you who know what Koboko is. <laughs> um, and they, they, my parents sacrificed everything to ensure that we could fulfill our potential. My dad has been calling me professor since I was six years old. <laughs> so in many ways, I think he called this day into existence. Um, and their support means everything to me. Um, my mom is here with my sister from Nigeria. Mom, can you please stand up? My I have three siblings, as, as the Dean mentioned. My sister is here from Nigeria, Shei or Shikolu, and I have my other sister, who is a professor of medical oncology in America. My brother is in America, who couldn't be here. But they support me in so many ways, and I'm so grateful to be part of the Williams family. Um, of course, I want to thank my husband and my children for their support. Um, many of you have already met my children, my, the eight-year-old entrepreneur and her, her six-year-old sidekick. <laughs> they brought so much love and laughter into my life, but they also turned my life into a Sophie. There's, there's more drama in our house than in Seven Delan. <laughs> I promised them that if they sat quietly, that I would buy them a new Lego set and LOL surprise dolls. <laughs> so sometimes corruption starts in the home. <laughs> and there's, there's nothing that blockchain can do for this. <laughs> So my coming to Stellenbosch in 2016 was facilitated by several people. Um, I need to specially mention Hugh Quino. Um, he has been a friend and a brother to me when I, since I met him in 2007 in Nottingham. And he worked so hard to get me here and get me settled. I'm so grateful for you. I really appreciate you. Um, I also want to thank this former Dean of Law, Sonia Human. She's not here, but she promised me that she'd be watching and that I should greet her. <laughs> <laughs> she, she has a medical back, a, a military background, so I don't, I don't mess with her. <laughs> so I think she made sure that my promotion was her last official act, and I'm very grateful to her. Um, the Department of Mercantile Law has been so, has shown me so much love, and I've really never worked with a kinder group of people. I want to mention Nicola, the dean, and a great boss and a friend. I want to mention Richard, the Vice Dean, and my former HOD. Um, I want to mention 
Karen Carlitz, who is our, our work mother. She takes care of all the women in our departments, like we're her children. <laughs> um, I want to mention Tuli Madonsela, South Africa's finest, <laughs> and Stellenbosch's celebrity academic. <laughs> <laughs> I also want to thank um, a number of people who have just been so kind and accommodating to me. Silka, Karen Bitz, Izel, Andre, Christoph, Anelia, Zaza, who can't be here, Philip, Sadula, Lisa, Sandy, Juanita, um, the non-academic staff, Annette, Yolandi, thank you so much, Yolandi, for all your work, Eileen, Kathy, and Herda. Thank you all of you for making me feel so welcome. Thank you for your kindness. It, it, it has meant the world to me. Um, I also want to thank some of my friends from far and near. I want to thank Dr. Ada Odo from UCT and her family. Um, she's been my friend for, for like decades and she's been such a support to me. I want to thank Bio, I didn't believe Bio, stand up, stand up. Bio is my friend from Nigeria. We are childhood friends and he flew all the way from Nigeria to be here today. <laughs> I also want to thank some of my friends from Hillsong Church in Cape Town, um, Tumi, Tanya, um, and Karabo. Uh, I want to also thank the Association of Nigerian Students in Stellenbosch, who made me their matron. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for your support. Thank you for coming. <laughs> the community, community is important. Community is everything. And I'm so grateful to have all of you as my community. So thank you so much. May God bless you all. Shope, congratulations. A futuristic but excellent inaugural lecture. Chimamanda Adichie tells us that the single story creates stereotypes. And the problem with stereotypes is not that they are untrue, but that they are incomplete. They make one story become the only story. So we are grateful that the story of a global academic such as you now adds to our story here in Stanbosch. So it may be shared with our students and with our colleagues, the experience and the knowledge and perspectives that you deliver to you. You make our story richer, you make us more complete. On behalf of our faculty, I wish you a very long and productive and happy career. Tonight, we will now celebrate with you over some refreshments and a glass of wine, your academic journey thus far, one that has led you here to Stellenbosch, and we are very happy that you are here. Enjoy your evening. Thank you to everybody who joined us tonight. We appreciate your presence and uh, we wish you a safe journey back home, but only after you have joined us with some refreshments in our court. Thank you very much. Thank you.